Um, my name is Laura Williams Argilla. I'm the director of services for professional video at Adobe Systems. I am a huge fan of VR content of all shapes and sizes. I first fell in love with VR when I was introduced to Sidra in Clouds Over Sidra, Chris Milk's amazing, beautiful documentary. Um, from that time forward, Adobe has been looking for ways that we can help support this emerging media and help filmmakers take full advantage of the opportunities that true immersive media provides. And it is one of my great pleasures at work that I get to spend time um, speaking and discovering what people are doing with our tools, without our tools, around our tools, to make this content that is incredibly special. And I love it. The topic of my talk today is what's going on in VR outside of gaming. Now, this is not a gaming audience, and I get that, but I think a lot of the standards in VR storytelling actually draw heavily from gaming. And while I myself am not much of a gamer, I have learned things from gaming, including never play, um, oh, damn it, now I'm drawing blank on the name. <laughs> it's a really terribly terrifying, um, horror game right before bedtime if you need sleep. Because VR has this way of getting into your skin and staying with you and keeping you horrified clear through to the morning. Um, I tend to think of categories in VR breaking down in, into four categories. The first being traditional entertainment. And see what I said about my slides there, not beautiful. Entertainment is what we're all good at, right? We understand storytelling, we understand the traditional trajectory of getting a viewer from point A to point B. And I think this is one I'm gonna to touch on very, very lightly. The theme that I'm seeing in entertainment VR is really that it's a secondary piece of a larger whole. Usually it's in support of a primary piece of storytelling and the VR experience rounds that out in some way. Um, there are some particularly compelling pieces. I think the Mr. Robot piece of Elliot's experience was wonderful in that it took VR to this full storytelling piece of Elliot's experience. And if you haven't seen it, I think you can't now. Uh, it was time bound. But if you get the opportunity, you should. Um, there's other similar pieces that, are, that draw you into a larger theatrical release that I believe add a lot to the overall story. The Jungle Book uh, VR components, to me, are also of this same caliber. Made me want to be involved, made me feel involved in a way that the film itself did not. Same with the Martians VR experience. But like I said, these are not where I'm gonna spend my time today. I think we understand how to do entertainment storytelling fairly well. And what I'd like to focus on is what's going on outside of entertainment that is utilizing the same technology, but stepping out of that box that we seem to put ourselves in often when we think about how to use a technology, how to translate a story into this new mechanism in order to draw that audience in for more. I've boxed uh, the three types of experiences into three loose categories, and some of them overlap a little bit. The first, I consider exploration. And this is a lot of what we think about, especially if people first coming to VR create these experiences that transport you from where you are right now to someplace else. The Great Wall of China, underwater. Um, these are incredibly useful. My son's school uses the uh, New York Times 360 app extensively when doing social studies. Gives children a different perspective on, on events in the world that help draw them in for engagement in traditional education in ways that pictures don't. Um, but what if the world that you're exploring is something that you can't physically visit even if you wanted to? There is a project called The Body VR, which is a medical book, essentially creating an interactive map of the human body where you can explore in an inner space type environment the, hum the anatomy of the human body, the systems taken apart one by one. And this isn't a children's level engagement. This book or this experience was created for medical students and, and is an auxiliary experience to a traditional medical school experience, which I think adds an additional level of value. Watching the systems interact together 
and then being able to move through those systems one by one provides future doctors a different level of experience earlier in their medical education than a traditional textbook does. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little nervous today for some reason. Um, it, wow. I'm blanking on what, oh, yes. Another unique use of exploration was a project that was uh, made as part of a fundraiser for a, a group called Pencils of Promise. Has anybody heard of this organization? Yes. They fund schools in developing countries. Thank you, kind face in the front row helps. <laughs> they fund schools in developing countries. And a, about a year ago, in their New York fundraiser, they brought together their most likely big donors. In this fundraiser, they built a classroom that simulates one of the classrooms that they teach in in Ghana, a 16-foot classroom with desks and chairs. In addition to that experience, they created a two-minute VR film that transported those same donors to Ghana, where they could experience what that real classroom felt like, the, the uh, clay floors, the brick walls, the fact that the classroom wasn't large enough to accommodate the students, so half the students were being taught outside under mango trees. Do you think it was effective? They raised $2 million that night, and that film in the first six months after it had been produced garnered 8 million additional views. The ability to engage the empathy of human beings once they feel that they have experienced something completely different, they've tethered themselves to another person's lives, can really motivate people to make a tighter connection. And in fact, this has been studied. The um, Institute for Virtual Human Relations at Stanford has done work in education with students to determine if virtual, uh, virtual reality education makes a difference. If it's not just about the engagement, if it can actually make a difference in the way students think and feel. And one of the experiments there, students were given an opportunity to participate in a forestry experiment where they, they had a vibrating uh, chainsaw that let them cut down trees in a VR experience. Later in the day, water was spilled as part of this experiment. The students who participated in the forestry experiment grabbed about half as many paper towels to clean up that water as the students who didn't. It made a cognitive switch in their brain about how they engaged with paper products and the use of paper products in that space. And I think when you start tying these things together, you can see that VR isn't just another form of entertainment. It's actually a way to modify behavior and to change the way that we interact with human beings. The next group of, of experiences it are experiential, which really is redundant when I say it up here on stage. Bear with me. We tend to think of these as the things that we hear a lot about, surgery simulators or flight simulators or simulators that allow you to drive machinery before you're actually trained on that machinery. These things that give you experiences that are different than what you might normally interact with. I've worked in Seattle with some filmmakers who are making projects that go beyond that simple task-driven experiential um, behavior. And they're trying to create a world where they can take people who may have different frames of reference and bring them into an environment so they can experience why that environment is important. The filmmakers I've been working with are, are LGBT filmmakers who are trying to bring the, bring the experience of large-scale pride celebrations to individuals around the world and to help Ex LGBT celebrants at Pride bring these experiences home to their family so their family can understand why that's an important part of their experience as a person in the world. And these kind of experiences can help start dialogues and hopefully change some of those misconceptions about it just being a party because there's a lot more to it than that. One of the other interesting places where experiential experiences, God, I'm going to hate that I chose that word, um, <laughs> where these experiential experiments is being explored is in the UK court system. In the court systems in the past, we've allowed um, simulations of crime scenes. 
And each simulation of a crime scene can be created by the opposing side. So you can have two conflicting simulations of a crime scene that best portray your side of that story. In the UK, in the UK court systems, they're starting to look at bringing a unified VR crime scene experience to the jurors. So they can sit in the box with a VR experience and look at the parts of the, that they feel are most relevant to their decision-making process instead of having it driven by someone else. Something that you wouldn't be able to do by taking a group of people traipsing through a, a you know, sensitive crime scene. And I think that these types of experience are in play now in ways that when we think back to entertainment, we don't necessarily think of as our stuff. <laughs> and yet, in order to do these well, they need people with production backgrounds and people with technical backgrounds to help tell these stories. The third group, the third and final group that I want to talk about are therapeutic. What's interesting here is that VR plays with our brains. And the way that we are transported from our day-to-day -day experience into the new experience is by essentially allowing ourselves to be tricked. The synchronization of an image, and better yet, when it has audio to, to the path of our head, and best yet, when we're allowed to be tethered within a spatial um, plane to that image, allows our brain to actually believe we're there. And there are several ways that VR now is being, is being created to help trick our brain into self-healing or self-help. One of the most well understood is a game called Snow World. And this game was developed in partnership with the University of Washington's Harborview Burn Center. What they've done is created a VR game experience where a participant flies over a snow-covered earth and has an adventure. They use this when they're changing dressings or performing other incredibly painful parts of the um, burn healing and skin graft process. This is some of the most painful medical procedures known. When they use the VR experience, people express that they are far more comfortable with these experiences or with these procedures. They also receive less medication. They've compared the VR experience to giving someone a Nintendo to play with, and it's 50% less pain if they're immersed in the VR experience because our brains separate from the system at play, and that's amazing. Another way that VR is being used in therapeutic uh, circumstances are for people su suffering PTSD. By slowly re reliving experiences that cause trauma within a controlled environment, people can reduce their overall distress response to those experiences. And this becomes more and more possible as the VR experiences can become more and more lifelike. So, soldiers returning from war can be put into circumstances that are very similar to their most traumatic experience and have that increased over time or decreased over time depending on their response. What they find is in subsequent brain scans is that the brain has healed the response to those distressing, to those distressing signals. And they're actually seeing your brain be able to once again reprocess those, those learnings. I think this is incredible. And I think that medical uses of VR, and I'm mildly obsessed with them, <laughs> are some of the most interesting. For those of you who have been around children with autism or adults with autism, you understand that some of the problems that, are fa that people with autism face are the ability to process social cues. The Autism Speaks organization has a, found, has a fellow right now who's working on a game for people with autism that helps them with cognitive processing of social cues where they are exposed to various facial expressions, social interactions over time and learn how to appropriately respond to those cues. It's a series of eight to 12 sessions. It takes time, it takes commitment, but what they found, once again, is that brain scans done after the, the training show areas of the brain light up for social cognitive recognition, 
that weren't lighting up previous to the training. So it's a really interesting way to address a problem that otherwise can cause a lifetime of limitations and difficulties. One further area where this is used in medical process is anxiety for people who, <laughs> maybe I should use that today. <laughs> Uh, for people with anxiety, one of the most effective treatments is cognitive behavioral therapy. And again, this is a slow exposure to the things that cause you stress. So maybe for me, it would be talking to five people and then seven people. But um, this can be difficult, especially when stressors are things like getting on a plane. How do you slowly expose yourself to getting on a plane? <laughs> kind of difficult. How do you control your exposure for people with agoraphobia to crowds? How do you take that two steps out of your house, two steps into a crowd, two steps into a really big crowd, and safely escape as your body starts having the stress response that's the big problem? They're finding that VR experience that are scalable, that can react and grow with someone's presence in that experience, are very effective ways at quickly reaping the benefits of cognitive behavioral therapy. There is also, there are also several <laughs> programs right now available to help with speaking stress, which I think was in my notes, and I think it's funny that I'm bringing it up now. <laughs> but it can, help, it can help speakers prepare for the size of the room that they're in, or the size of the audience that they're anticipating, through a virtual experience, where they can practice and practice and practice, growing the audience each time until their delivery becomes as comfortable and confident as it does when they present to themselves in the mirror. I personally think all of these developments are exciting and worthwhile. I think that as um, technologists, as people within the entertainment sphere, these are interesting areas that have been picked up as part of a whole. I think when we look at how VR is represented, we tend to focus on our box of entertainment not understand, not always paying full attention to the, ex, to the auxiliary uses of this very powerful technology. One of my big concerns with this technology is that right now, the threshold to get in and make quality VR work is high. So what's the future? I, as a member of Adobe staff, believe that we need to make our tools as accessible and low entry point as possible to help people tell these stories, to help people utilize this technology and become as much a part of the solution as possible. I also believe that all of us as technologists need to look to those fields where people may have ideas or concepts or interests that could be <coughs> exploited for social good, for other uses than pure entertainment, and trust me, entertainment is awesome. I'm not saying that that's not a worthwhile use of our time. But I also think that there, this field is a lot larger than we tend to think of when we think about, well, what, how is this going to replace movies or how is this going to supplant television? The field of VR content creation is actually far broader than we, than we currently evaluate it as. And I think the fact that many of these, these processes that have been kicking up around us, these projects that I've just mentioned, while maybe small and not super well funded, show an interest by multiple pockets of individuals in making this area grow. Thank you.